This is 2OF Entertainment. Hi, it's Kiffin LeBates here, and today's video is going to be a random walk around some of the topics concerning the Ethereum merge. I'm going to be looking at it from the perspective of a developer and what it takes in order to run a new Ethereum node post-merge, but I'll try and explain it in a way that means that this actually makes sense and is somewhat informative to people who are not developers. So what I did over the weekend was I took my old deprecated Ropston Ethereum mining machine and I installed the Gurley testnet on it in order to fully understand what the different components are and what they do. I've read about them over the last few months but I always find that actually getting your hands dirty and doing stuff for me anyway is the best way to learn and actually make statements about these things that are relatively well informed. So if we start with a recap of how things used to be back in the good old days for the test nets and how they still currently are for Ethereum mainnet but won't be as of September 15th to the September 17th, something like that, when the Ethereum mainnet is going to move to the new um, merged network. Back in the old days, uh, what you needed was a computer with a reasonably fast disk a good amount of RAM but not a crazy amount and the Ethereum client software. Now there are lots of Ethereum client software packages out there. Most people however use Geth. The people involved in this are trying to push people to use some of the other clients but it's a bit like them saying you know there's lots of hot drinks out there, tea, cocoa, uh, why don't you have one of those and everybody plumps for coffee because that's what everybody else is going for. So Geth is kind of like the coffee of the Ethereum client world. And when you're running a Geth client on your computer, it's connecting to the Ethereum peer-to-peer -peer network. It's receiving transactions from the other clients and it's receiving blocks from the other clients. And once your node has verified a block, it adds it to the top of the blockchain. And similarly, if you're running one of these Ethereum clients, you can send transactions to it and they then get propagated around the whole network. And the nice thing about running your own client is you don't have to rely on the services of entities such as Infura or Alchemy, who are basically running a bunch of Ethereum clients to try and ensure that there's 100% uptime. Um, it's a form of centralization, but it's convenient. So that's why most people use them. Anyway, that was the old style of things, and if you wanted to mine on the Ethereum blockchain, then you also needed some mining software and a decent graphics card. So, it used to be two pieces of software, the Ethereum client and some mining software, and then you were ready to go, and your graphics card would overheat and uh, slowly grind to a halt as you tried to find Ethereum. Now, with the new setup post-merge, then you need three pieces. You need still the Ethereum client, which is now called the execution layer, and you need uh, something called a beacon chain node. And if you're going to stake Ether in order to gain more Ether over time, this is the validators of proof of stake replacing the miners of proof of work, you're going to need a third piece of software which is going to act as a validator. So it's got a little bit more complicated in one sense, but on the other hand, setting up miners used to be really tricky because they relied on graphics cards. Graphics cards use a rather difficult to configure library typically OpenGL, and most of the problems I've seen people having with getting a full mining node working on Ethereum revolved around problems with their graphics cards. There are so many different ones, and the mining software seemed to have been cobbled together by random hobbyists, so uh, that turned out to be quite tricky. So, personally, I'll be glad to see the back of that. No more problems building stuff with Make that are written in C++. But back to the post-merge setup. So 
on the test nets, the current test net to use is called Gurley. Uh, it's been running for a long time in Ethereum 1 mode. Now it's switched fully to Ethereum 2. There's no mining on it anymore. And there was this other network, a beacon chain network called Prater, which has been merged into Gurley. And the two of them together are now called Gurley. So uh, I think that's a mistake in the naming because it makes things a little bit confusing in order to understand that there's been a transition because one of the things has maintained its name all the way through and the other thing has merged and it's lost its identity. But anyway, Gurley is now the test net to use. Um, it's a shame from my perspective because I was a big Ropston fan and I had a lot of Ropston ETH. Um, but, you know, they pick this, they go with it. I could have picked Gurley earlier on and then I would have had a lot of Gurley ETH and I could have run a faucet for it, but all my Robston is now worthless. And the thing is that people could have continued to run Robston as the old Ethereum 1 network that it was, but it's run by developers. They want to keep up with what's happening. There weren't very many miners running on it in the first place. I seem to remember typically about four or five at a time. So uh, now that those four or five miners have probably moved on to Gurley. Robston is dead and God gone. R.I.P. Gurley. Anyway, back to the configuration. So there are these three things. The execution layer, for which I've been using Geth. The beacon chain layer, for which I've been using something called Lighthouse. And the validator layer, third part, uh, for which I've also been using Lighthouse because the people who've written this piece of software called Lighthouse have folded the uh, the beacon chain layer and the validator layer into one package, but you need to run it twice. Once with a command line parameter saying that you're running it as a beacon chain node, and once with a parameter saying you're running it as a validator. So let's look at those three bits again. So you've got this geth execution layer client. That's doing exactly the same thing as the Ethereum client used to do before. It's the peer-to-peer -peer network component. It's the one that propagates all the transactions that it receives around the network, receives transactions, builds up something called the mempool, which is a list of all the unprocessed transactions. Um, it receives the blocks and adds them to the top of the blockchain, and it contains the Ethereum virtual machine, which is like a, a virtual computer that runs the smart contracts that are stored on the blockchain. And then hopefully all these different execution layer clients, when they run the smart contracts, come up with the same answers and then you have consensus. And we all know that we have a single view of the world, exactly who owns what at what time. So that's all very well and good. And you need the execution uh, layer client because it's building that single view of the world. And the next thing is this beacon chain node. And the beacon chain, it's kind of like a time server to ensure that time moves forward at the same rate for everybody. And it's a random number generator. And that part's really important because with proof of work, you're randomly selecting the next person who gets to make a block through lots and lots of different computers competing through mining. <clears throat> so a miner is doing the equivalent of printing random lottery tickets in the hope that at some point they'll print the winning ticket that allows them to make the next block. And that was the genius insight of Nakamoto, was that this would work as a great way to have a decentralized random number generator. Because creating random numbers is really hard, and doing so in a decentralized manner where you don't have one authority creating the random numbers and then maybe some other people checking up on them um, is very, very hard. And I'm not going to go into how the beacon chain does this because it gets complex very quickly, but the beacon chain is a way for a group of participants to generate a random number in order to select the next proof of stake block maker, also known as a validator, um, in a hopefully truly fair and random fashion, thereby distributing the rewards for creating that block fairly amongst all the participants in proportion to the amount of ETH that they've staked. And the idea there is that the more ETH that you've staked, the more you have at stake, and therefore the more honest you will be. Because if you start messing around, there's this thing called slashing, where the other participants can look at what you've done and say, hey, that one's cheating, and then they have the right under the protocol to seize some or all of the assets that you've staked. So that's kind of like uh, providing a deposit when you're renting a car. 
The idea of the deposit is that you won't then go and trash the car because you'll lose your deposit. So that's the beacon chain part. And then the third piece is the validator component. And I don't really know why they felt the need to keep a, pull that part out as a third entity. I guess it's because if you just want to run a node that is watching what's happening, now you need those two components, the execution layer and the beacon chain layer. Um, so maybe that's why they kept those bits separate and had this third thing, which is a validator. And the validator monitors what the beacon chain layer and the execution chain layer are doing in order to determine whether the beacon chain's random number has selected your validator as the next block generator. And if your uh, validator has been chosen, it then informs the execution layer client that now it's um, my turn to make a block the execution layer has all the information stored in it in order to build a valid block and it then goes ahead and does it. The validator signs that block, off it goes to the network and hurrah, you have managed to get a block generation reward. So that's kind of an overview of the whole new setup. In one sense it has become more complex in that there are these extra components and as I said the beacon chain in particular is particularly tricky to understand. On the other hand, it's got rid of mining and managing graphics cards, which from a developer perspective is a welcome goodbye to that. So uh, that's kind of a quick overview from a developer's point of view, what this whole new setup looks like. Hopefully those of you who are thinking of setting up a test network setup like me, or maybe you do happen to have 32 ETH sitting around that you can put into a staker and you want to run your own Ethereum mainnet staker. So good luck with that. Um, and uh, well done to you having that much spare ETH kicking around. Um, then maybe you can even take that over and apply this knowledge to running a mainnet staker. And there are plenty of articles out there walking you through how to do this. Um, there are a bunch of other components which I haven't touched on at the very beginning, namely how the practicalities of staking your ETH, or in the case of the Gurley network, your Gurley ETH um, on the chain works. Um, actually, it's worth mentioning that there's a smart contract that was deployed onto the chain and it holds the ETH that you stake and the clients check that smart contract in order to work out who has staked how much and whether or not they're allowed to therefore uh, generate blocks. But again, I won't go into that too much because I could probably talk about that for half an hour. So uh, that's the whole setup. Go and look for tutorials. Maybe I'll put some in links below this video if I can find them. Um, and uh, have fun. That's it for today. See you in the next video soon. Bye for now.